One of the biggest concerns that I heard both as a financial advisor and then as a wholesaler in the financial services industry from individual clients was always the level of government debt in America. Now, obviously, that has swelled recently, and there is a great piece. Government debt swells. Is it sustainable? Go out to our website, value-ability.com under the content tab. The PDF version of it is available to you. Bottom line is always, I would always try and break things down for people. And you've heard me say this on the podcast before in terms that they understand, right? One of our podcast guests, JJ Wenrick used the lemonade stand, right? A business is like a lemonade stand. You use that analogy. And I use the same analogy for government debt, right? Household income and household debt. If you have a debt of a million dollars, that's unsustainable if you only make $50,000 a year. If you make $2 million a year, that's a totally different proposition. And government debt is very, very similar. So as government debt swells, it is relevant to, in relation to the gross domestic product. So in the short term, you know, this piece lays out, do we need to be worrying about government debt? Probably not. Rates are low. It is cheap to get the money. But in the long term, yes, we do need to address the debt yes. over the long term. So if your clients are asking those questions, definitely go out and check out this piece on our website. And it does have a little bit to do with our topic today. Episode 45, Practice Succession. We have Aaron Hassler, Managing Partner of Skyview Partners on. And one of the things that you look at when you're buying a practice in financial planning world is debt. So a little bit of a connection there on the intro piece, but welcome to the Valuability Podcast. The Valuability Podcast is for financial professionals, business owners, and anyone interested in financial planning, business, leadership, and personal development. We believe that financial success comes from building a plan on the foundation of your values and building your ability will help you get there. My name is Danforth Fleek. I was a financial advisor and wholesaler, as I mentioned, for over 20 years in financial services. I'm joined each week by my co-host, friend, and mentor, Philip Simonson. Philip has been in financial services for over 40 years as a financial advisor, field leader, trainer, and senior manager covering areas such as advisor development and field operations. You know, as I was thinking about the topic of succession, Philip, while I've known some financial advisors who have passed on their business to their kids, it seems like it's not that none of your kids have gotten into the financial services business. And it just seems like it's not as common uh, as it is in other businesses where it's just in many cases assumed that uh, like one of my tenants, his dad owns a, a landscaping company and his brother is taking over that business. You see that all the time, but mm -hmm. what's your thoughts on that? Is, is it seem like it's less common in financial services to you? I don't have the statistics on it. Now, myself personally, I gave up my practice early on, so there was nothing for them sure. to buy. Uh, so we didn't even have those conversations. And two, they would see me as, you know, as a, you mentioned, a senior leader. I'd leave on Mondays. It was before Zoom, before the pandemic, and I'd come home Thursdays. And I, right. you know, I met the people where they were, and that was on the roads. And I had that dubious, you know, honor of, you know, acquiring. I remember one year, you know, it was back in the '80s, a million miles just with American Airlines. Uh, not good, really. However, I do see, you know, other people that I have as uh, neighbors or friends. They are uh, who have built a very sizable practice and where there's a strong recurring revenue. Uh, I've seen a couple of them uh, bring on their children. It's always going to be a challenge because it's boundary work and um, and uh, it's it's it. I do see it, but I don't know how you know statistically how it compares to other industries. It's a great right. point you make. 
But I think anytime it's, boy, you, it's, you got to put your business hat on and it's not just the family and parenting hat. It's, it's tough stuff. Well, that's funny you say that, you know, kids seeing the lifestyle. I, I had kind of the same experience with my dad as considered going in the military, going in the Navy. Right. But one of the things that uh, at the time, 1991, when I got out of high school, they just didn't need people. They were scaling back after the fall of the you know, Iron Curtain and, and they weren't really looking for people. When I went in and talked to the recruiter, I remember them just saying they weren't really looking for people. But then in the back of my mind also was the lifestyle. If you have a family, being in the military is very challenging at times, especially earlier on in your career. You go off for – you're on a boat for six months. <laughs> you're not around. So, yeah, it, interesting to see that dad's gone on Monday home on Friday. Well, maybe I don't want to do that <laughs> oh, side no. of the business. Well, right. Well, and also interesting, we have somebody who is a, a, a longtime friend of ours on the mm -hmm. podcast today, as I mentioned, Aaron Hassler. Now, before we get to him, uh, you can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, tune in wherever you find your podcasts. We should be there. You can also find us on YouTube, search value dash ability on YouTube to find us there. Or you can find us on our website, value-ability.com, under the Episodes tab. Our episode player is on the website. Wherever you find us, please like, review, subscribe, and share. We had an all-time high for subscribers this month, so thank you so much. And if you are a consistent listener, please consider subscribing and definitely let other people know. It would help us out a ton. We appreciate it. As always, if you want to connect with us, our email is info at value-ability.com. Again, that's info at value-ability.com or all of our social media links are on our website. Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook links are at value-ability.com under the Contact Us tab. So without further ado, let's move on to our conversation with Aaron Hassler of Skyview Partners. And we are now joined by a longtime friend of both Philip and mine, Aaron Hassler, managing partner at Skyview Partners. Now, just to let the audience know how far back this goes, my first gig scratching my horrible little chicken scratch on old triplicate forms as the ops manager. We hired you so I could dump that horrible job on you back in the day. Right. So you really started out in the business as I did you know, on the operations and compliance side. We all we all go way back, don't we? Uh, long time listener, first time caller. Glad to be on right. the show. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> very good. Very good. Excellent. But then pretty quickly after that, you ended up moving into the recruiting side right. of yeah. the yeah. the financial, you know, advisor management business and, and you pretty much stayed there uh, on that side of the business uh, until yeah. just recently when you've still the, basically the same area of the business but it's it's changed a little bit with skyview so yeah. just tell us a little bit about your background and and how it developed i mean i know we've kept in touch over the years but yeah. just so listeners know kind of where where you're coming from in terms of your experience well, it's uh, it's fun. So obviously what led me to kind of meeting the two of you was an internship in college, right? And mm -hmm. uh, then I got into this industry and I knew nothing about financial services. Uh, my dad was a physician. His dad was a scientist. You know, I didn't, you know, I, what I knew was, was that medical world. And uh, so it was fun to get into this business because you started to realize that the temperament for uh, my father's personality as a physician wasn't that different than that of a financial advisor. You're kind of investigating questions and, and speaking to people and listening and trying to help solve a problem. And I, I think, uh, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And so I think he and I are relatively similar personalities. Um, so did I know that 20 some years ago? No, absolutely no. not. But um, it was a day job and it, and it put a, a roof over my head. And um you know, I, I think I did find out, and I, I used to always joke, is that I I, I learned that I was definitely not a uh, operations, you know, process <laughs> management type of guy. Uh, and somebody had asked me, like, what what was the hardest thing, you know, you had coming out of college? And I, I remember it was it was managing that you know team of people and working in an office and managing these people that were 
20 some years my senior and and trying to navigate that world and that was not something i was totally prepared for with my liberal arts education but um <laughs> luckily we had philip <laughs> it was exactly, a lifesaver right? <laughs> um but it was a great experience and then and then i i did get into the recruiting side by default which was which was really what i liked and i, I would say this you know, our first, um, you know, experience with the U.S. Advisors Network really just helped me kind of find my maturity uh, and and allow me to find out what I was good at, uh, which is, I suppose, what first jobs do well with, right? Right. Um, and so I found that I really enjoyed the people. I enjoyed the uh, assessing what people's issues and challenges were and helping prescribe that problem and, and find them a better path forward. And uh, recruiting was that. That was interesting. I enjoyed communicating with people and kind of saying, hey, you know, here are your options on the table. Let me tell you about this. And if it's the right opportunity for you, then let's put it together. Um, and that was always kind of my style. And so I ended up, you know, after after really kind of starting to find my stride with helping um, Nate Berglund find, you know, new credit unions and new advisors to fill in those spots. Um, you know, it's like anything, I think with your first job, you always think you know better and can do it better. And, and an opportunity to uh, you know, move to LPL and strike out on my own was fun. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I worked, I went to LPL and I worked for a couple of the guys that were, I call them kind of the Tom Coughlin style coaching. If, if oh, everybody right. remembers him from the Giants, just Absolutely. a tough old bird. And he just, you know, get you on the phone and chew you out and, and tell you what you did wrong. And show up meetings late. You're going to pay a hundred dollar fine. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. And, and just, you know, and, and, drive the mechanics, drive the process, um, you know, do the, do the activities every day kind of thing. Yep. Um, and, and that was enjoyable, but what it did was allow me to find my voice. And, and so after working for them for a few years and then going through the financial crisis, um, you know, I was able to circle around and start my own business. And that was, you know, something I always said I was going to start my own business. Of course, I thought it was gonna be like a ski shop, you know, in Colorado. Right. <laughs> um, that was always the dream. And, and then, uh, Still time. Still time. That's right. Um, that'll be my retirement job. Um, mm -hmm. And so so I started out as a third party recruiter. That was the business I built. And it was taking all that, you know, experience I'd had over the previous 10 years. And and what I always liked was that consultation and figuring out what makes people tick, what was their unique quality, what drove their business. And so I took that and allowed it to help me find the right broker dealer or custodial platform for them. You know, as I listen, it's no different than what an advisor does. It's totally the same. You just took it to a different level, but you found out what their needs are. Then you just came in with the plan and here's the different implementation steps and or recommendations. I always thought that from a wholesaling standpoint as well, yeah. that in this business, it's really all the same process, just at different levels. Mm -hmm. I was always coming in and sitting down and trying to look at, it's one of my favorite uh, meetings ever this old broker come in and sit down and uh, he's kind of being a little cagey with me and i'm like well i'm just here to see if there's anything i can do to help out and he says oh thank god i thought you were here to help me build my business i hate it when you not nose punk come in here and tell me you're here to help me build my business i already built my business <laughs> yeah. so but but it is it, it's just that consultative approach of what can i do to help out what do you yeah. need a holistic approach really yeah. just like a physician like you said your father they don't yeah. you know they look at the mental they look or the psychology they look yeah. at the spiritual they look at the you know the biology they you know they they look at all the spheres before they then before they piece together their solution well we do the same thing my uh, my 12 year old's kind of a world war ii history buff and uh, oh, cool. uh i was always describing to him i as a kid my father would uh had to go do rounds on a lot of saturdays and so he would take me with him and i'd sit there in the chair in the hospital room and he would build a relationship with the patient right and he's asking about them and he's building that trust so that when he gives them a, the advice or the prescription that he kind of needs they take the medicine they do what he's asking them to do and, um, you know, I learned that, I think, a little bit from, you know, following him around on sure. rounds on a Saturday morning. Yeah. And as I as I described to my uh, son, by asking questions and by by learning about people, my father in the late 80s into the 90s had a unique opportunity with all these World War Two veterans to hear their kind of end of life stories as they're on their deathbed. Wow, powerful. And so we got to hear some, you know, incredible stories of, uh, you know, survival and, and trials and tribulations and, and work. 
And um, it's all because you invest in the people. And, and that's what we've always, I've always tried right. to do is invest in the people, understand what, you know, what they need, how I can help and, and whether I can be a solution for them. And if I can't, I can't, but um, I enjoy helping people. And, and it's a fun position to be in. You know, I've been out to your sky, you know, to your website and, you know, Skyview Partners. And it looks, it's excellent website to all our yep. listeners out Thanks. there. And I'm, it's not a shameless plug. I'm truly, you get there and you look at it. It is very good. And it's, it appears it is set up for the, you know, you're set up for the sellers. Can you, you know, I've got a few questions I'd like to ask, but, but can you kind of just paint a broad brush picture of uh, yep. who your clients are, who are your ideal clients, who would be a good fit for you? Um yeah, maybe start there, and I, I mean, we can go from go from there. Well, I'll give my uh, uh, the website credit to my business partner Scott Wetzel. He was the one that uh, put all the hard work into that, and it was truly a, a, a laborious process, right? I mean, it's expensive, and and yes. uh, the amount of uh, you know, having done one myself, I know how much work I went into it. Um, yeah, Philip. I mean, we so so. I'll just tell you real quickly. The genesis of Skyview Partners was was the idea that. I had been in my recruiting business doing some succession plans and it was by default. Advisors were saying, Hey, well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about a broker dealer change, but really, you know, can you help me? And the, the original guy who wanted me to help them sell his business was young and he wanted to get out of the industry and go do something else. And so I sold it and then uh, we had fun with it. It was a great time. And mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed the process and, and just by default, it, other people started coming to me, but then, I started looking at this and it, this was the time in, in, you know, mid, uh, what is this? 2010, you know, the 2010s, whatever those are called. And, um, you know, you had guys like Rick Edelman talking about mass consolidation. You had the roll up starting to come into play. And I'm thinking as a guy in my mid thirties, you know, what the hell am I going to do? Um, you know, if there's this mass consolidation, broker dealer consolidation. Um, and I started thinking about it that way. And, um, and just kind of thinking about what the strategy was and where our industry was headed. And so I started to develop a process I call generational partnerships, which is the idea that all of these founding, you know, advisors with these, with these now large scalable enterprises that had significant value um, needed to find their replacing uh, business partners. And so we started working on this generational partnership process. And it was the idea you're bringing in an experienced advisor that somebody doesn't have to train in from scratch. And you can plug them into a firm. Well, it was all great, and, and then I realized, oh, I, I don't, I don't really have a way to finance this. Um, mm -hmm. And so my business partner Scott uh, had bumped into our, our third business partner, Chris Jewett, and Chris's brother had started a commercial finance company, uh, and that got the discussion going. And I wish I knew what it was, but I just remember where we met. We met at some restaurant in St. Louis Park, some Mexican Mexican restaurant, and we started throwing the ideas around. Um, and then Scott started working on it behind the scenes of, you know, I want to get out of wholesaling. I want to go do this. This would be interesting. Um, and so it, it came to, okay, you know, all of us have a day job. Are we going to do this or not? And, and it was January of 2018 that we jumped in with both feet. Um, and I started going from my office in a diner out to Wyzetta. My wife was like, where are you going every day? Uh, your, your commute seems to take a lot longer. And I said, well, we're just trying something out. We're going to see if it works. And uh, so we knew that succession planning wasn't happening in our industry because it was too easy for founders to stay working on the business, right? Amen. You're making good money. You're Absolutely. in control. You're, you're running a good lifestyle. Um, but clients need it. It goes back to that whole kind of you know fiduciary responsibility or as my father had said, you know, his decision pivot point when he needed to retire was that he couldn't keep up with the continuing ed, you know, that that was required of him. And he felt like he was putting his clients' lives in jeopardy if he didn't keep up. And I, I feel like we have that responsibility or obligation in our industry. And I had an advisor that was a Vietnam vet and he died as we were trying to sell his business and, and trying to work with his spouse as the clients are leaving in droves and trying Fire to sale. hang on to value. It was awful, right? Yeah, got it. You know, and so, so all of these kind of accumulated into this idea that if we can bring secure bank financing to the marketplace in, in mass scale, then we could benefit the industry. And, and the key was bringing these in as conventional commercial loans, non-SBA loans, because mm -hmm. they allowed these founders to stay on and provided a lot more flexibility and choice. Right. SBA was the traditional way. It was the only way. 
right. right? For the most part, right? And 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 that was because banks didn't understand the systemic market risk in the cash flow nature of these businesses. But yet we, as the industry was going, advisors were building their businesses as if these were sellable enterprises, right? Because you got the recurring revenue that can be yeah. monetized, just like a dental pro practice. And they just keep growing, right? You just set it and forget it, and, and the assets keep growing. So, so it was kind of fun to see the culmination of all this come together. And uh, it, it helps to have some really good business partners um, that can be, you know, extra set of eyes, ears, and, and you put ideas together and, and that's how things can really develop. So it's been a fun process. But ultimately what we've done is, is created Skyview as a resource for buyers uh, or for people who are in an acquiring position at some point to come to us and understand commercial financing and how we can help. And, and our job is to really serve as their kind of agent and advocate through the commercial lending process because it's still in its infancy for our industry and it's a lot of work. And a lot of these guys have businesses to run, and and right. so we try and take some of this workload off their plate. Yeah, and there's a great link right off of the uh, skyview.com website. Uh, right on the right-hand side, you'll see a link that says get pre-approved within 48 hours. Click on that link. takes yeah. you to the, the pre-approval questionnaire. Uh, one of the things that popped into my mind is I obviously having been in the business for a long time, I, I understand the concepts behind this, but not the nitty gritty details that get in there. Uh, there's a bunch of different types of, of loans here. When somebody goes to that page, can you give an yeah. idea of what some of those, so like acquisition, sell and stay, legacy su succession, what some of those mean? Just so if, if somebody's looking at it, what, uh, what options out there and, and what they mean kind of to the actual advisor? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, you know, I'll say this to, it, it's cash flow lending, which is essentially what we have here, which is that there isn't hard collateral, right? You have client relationships and assets that you're selling. You're selling essentially that client relationship and that revenue. And so cash flow lending is tricky. And so what we've done is kind of broken it down into different types so that it's understandable um, and it allows us to get an insight into the transaction, you know, right out of the gate. So an acquisition is I'm, you know, firm owner A and I'm buying firm owner B and I'm going to buy him out in totality and we can finance 100% of those. Hmm. Um, and the sell and stay is the idea that that same thing, it's kind of a successor can sell, but can stick around. And, um, and so he's just going to get some chips off the table and keep that's right. If you want, what that's one way and still stay. And you know, if you want to sell 49% or 51% right. or any of that, um, and then legacy succession, I really like these. These are the, the one I talked to this morning, just a couple hours ago, was a father son team. So son is buying out the father. Um, and I feel like this was our general motivation for starting this business is as you get these firms that are bigger and bigger multi billion dollar enterprises. There's a lot of advisors that really choose to kind of continue to own and, and run the business the way they want to and and not have to sell out to these private equity consolidators. And so we wanted to compete against that option, right? Mm -hmm. All of these options are accretive to the industry and, and private equity has been a great tool uh, to come into our industry and, and drive value up and, and prove that there is value. But at the end of the day, a lot of these owners want to sell to their employees who busted their butt and, and help them, you know, build the enterprise the way it is today. So that's what your legacy succession is. Um, we see some mergers and levelizations just in, among partnerships. Um, and then we obviously refinance a lot of SBA loans and SBA debt as practices mature. So I'm working on one right now with a, a large firm and, and they're consolidating from a couple of different bank partners that they have. And what we've done is built this network of banks, but because we're in this position of advocacy for the, the wealth manager, the wealth management firm, you know, the idea that, that we can consolidate it and then be his advocate and his voice to get more capital to continue to buy these uh, practices that he's been purchasing all over the country. Uh, so we see a lot of that. So it, it's really fun. We've seen businesses on, on, on every, you know, scope and size from, you know, the one that I'm, I'm just, getting text messages as we're talking here today. I've got a gentleman that he doesn't own a big business. It's maybe 25, 28 million. Um, but he's buying a practice in Florida. That's about 75 million. It's really going to change his career. He's got his, sure. his mid thirties and, uh, it's really been fun to help him acquire this business. Um, and it kind of puts him into a tier that 
you know, I don't, I don't know that he'd be a natural asset gatherer, a guy that's going to bring in lots of assets every year. Um, but he runs a business really well. And, and we see that. And, and I like giving a voice to these guys as well. Right. Uh, it adds diversity and it adds talent to our industry that this industry needs. We're, we're bleeding people. And that was the, the problem I saw 10 years ago is we continue to lose good talent because you either can't sell enough insurance to, you know, pay your rent and you go out and get a job at Target Corporation or, you know. Um, and so commercial financing helps, you know, fuel good talent into the industry it's competitive against law school or medical school or whatever else you want to do oh very very great right? point there absolutely and, right and these are fun businesses i mean what a, what great profit margins um great need out there and mm -hmm. and i feel like the more we keep these private um it gives consumers the choice and, right. and the consumers need more choice and we need more firms yeah i think the numbers that i saw even 10 years ago was that we need half a million advisors. We're at 300,000. Yeah. Well, and, 325, 330. Yep. Right. Yep. And that we're going to lose half of those yep. in the next 10 years. So we're like, you're, we're negative 400,000 advisors over the next decade or so. And that's just staggering. Now, does, uh, does somebody need an actual target in mind when they come to you or can they just be at the stage of I want to explore this and just have my ducks in a row because that was I had a opportunity that was on the property casualty side and yeah. I ended up losing out I, I don't think I ever actually had a chance actually I think I yeah. was kind of being yeah. used as a bargaining right. chip but it, in the end it, it, it the other guy had his ducks in a row and got the financing put together in a week where I was still at the filling out my, my application stage. <laughs> the, um, it, you know, it's interesting you say that Dan, because, uh, you know, you always have surprises when you start a new business. And I think our surprise was that we got so much business in the door right away and we just started hiring employees. And then, um, the second though, was that, that, the consumer education was such a great demand on our time. And I didn't expect that part, um, but we've spent a tremendous amount of time educating advisors and educating the industry as to how you can use this tool and what the advantages are. And so one of the things that we did, and, and um, I think it's working is we created a site called the Advisory Practice Board of Exchange or APBOE.com. It looks really cool on paper. It's a lot harder to say on a phone or a podcast, but we didn't think through that. Um, but the idea was that you could create this transaction marketplace that was that was better than, say, a succession link um, and provided more services. But then I wanted, you know, we had to figure out some way to allow advisors to demonstrate that, um, you know, they had the ability to get bank financing. And so we created purchasing power. And so advisors can go to the APO website and uh, we, we kept them separate and we're starting to merge the two uh, to provide more, you know, links uh, between the two organizations. But purchasing power is a tool that I really like because an advisor can go on there and they can upload their important documents, their P&L, their tax returns. And we do a light amount of due diligence and underwriting on them and essentially just deem them credit worthy to get bank financing. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just adding some services to that. But the idea being that if you're a buyer, which a lot of people are in this industry, you, you do have to, like you said, Fleet, get your ducks in a row. You gotta, you gotta have yourself set up. You gotta go into those meetings with that, you know, binder of materials, uh, or you're late to the game. And so, with purchasing power, what we're demonstrating is that, you know, if you're a buyer and you're serious about buying, go get purchasing power verified, get your score, and then you can go to that seller and you can say, hey, just so you know, I have this purchasing power verification. I know I can get bank financing because they, they've told me this. So let's talk about what's important to you, seller. Let's talk about what your business is. Let's talk about your career. What makes you tick? What do you like to do? What's important for you in a succession plan? And how could you and I potentially work together? So by, by saying, hey, we've got bank financing here, let's take that emotion off the table and let's deal with all the other emotions that we have which is the anxiety around leaving your practice, leaving relationships and, and personalities behind, you know, taking care of employees. You know, there's, these are such highly emotional, uh, detailed transactions. And so we're really just trying to, you know, 
demonstrate to a lot of these sellers that bank financing is available, that buyers can afford these, and, and that this is an option that they should think about. And, and that's been an ongoing effort. Aaron, you, you raised a couple of great points there and, and I'd like to expound on them. One, I, I, the game hasn't changed. I'm just going to go back, you know, for as advisors, right? That we're glorified social workers by heart, but capitalists by brain. You know, and yeah, it's a right, very noble totally. profession if we do it well. <laughs> and, and then the other point that you've just referenced is, you know, and I'd like to expound on a little bit more, if you may, for our listeners here. The emotional roadblocks that are keeping them from, you know, you know, having a breakthrough. And, you know, some of them, like you said, it, you know, I got you know, my clients, you know, they've, they've become family and, and my, my employees, that's another big one. Are they going to be taken care of? I'm sure there's emotional roadblocks on both sides. Is there any bits of advice you can give both the buyer and seller to, you know, to kind of acid test, you know, I'm ready. Uh, and I got to get ready <laughs> to get, you know, to be ready. I totally. In fact, it's uh, it's kind of funny that we're doing this today because I, I recorded a podcast. We did a quick you know series of podcasts that'll be on our website, and we talked about roadblocks and, and the emotions for um, you know how do you finish these deals, and it's tricky. And as I always say to the buyers, it's you have to you have to sit down and really think about the emotions of what a seller is going through, and you got to listen to them and hear what they say and hear them talk about their practice and, and ask them the questions about what's important to them. And it's not a lot different, you know, for any of these guys as, as what you would do with a normal client relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, with a client relationship, you're building trust, you're identifying what solutions you have and what the plan is going forward. And, and working with sellers is the same thing. And what I think is, um, is so important is to understand what is that other person's perspective? What's really unique about our industry, I think more so than any other, is that you're potentially working together at least for a year, if not for a little longer as you transition those clients' relationships, right? Right. So I remember hearing this, and I'm, I'm a terrible person with quotes, but you know the whole idea that everybody walks away from uh, the negotiation tab table frustrated than everybody's won. And, and I... I couldn't disagree more. I think in this industry, at least, everybody has to walk away from that negotiation table, ready to shake hands and eager to take the next step. And they feel like they, both parties have won. In, and both in, parties have won. Because otherwise, it's yeah, it's it's not it's not healthy. And so so, but a lot of buyers don't take that approach in our industry. They still just it's hey, I'm going to go strike a deal. I'm going to you know. Uh, figure out the cheapest I can buy this practice and, and then I'm just going to take it over and I'm going to run it the way I want to run it. Um, mm. You can't do that with these uh, with these sellers as far as, because the, the the option for them, unless they have a health event that's driving it, is, oh, I'll just keep working. Yeah. You know, my clients aren't saying anything anyway. Do they want a succession plan? Sure. But, you know, are they are they asking me? Yeah, they are. But I don't need to sell it, right? Right. And and so I always say to a, to a buyer, is, sit down, listen to what the, seller has to say, put yourself in their shoes. Um, and then, you know, it's funny, we, we, we talk about um, the good old days at U.S. Advisors Network and and uh, you guys know this quote's coming, right? Um, <laughs> Inspect what you expect. <laughs> <laughs> the listeners know that as well. We hear that a Do couple they? times. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Good, good. I, hope, I hope Nate's listening and we can talk about this one. Um, messing with you to love you, brother. That's <laughs> right. Quit that's messing right. with you. You're in trouble. So thanks for the messing with me. But but it's you know. But what's so funny is, I mean, there are a lot of times where that statement rings super true, right? Right. And and so mm -hmm. we always say, we always say to the buyers is, inspect what you expect. And the way I translate that in terms of their businesses is, is we're trying to go out and tell advisors, you you are a corporation now. You're you're buying practices. You need to inspect your own business, understand your numbers, mm -hmm. understand your growth rates, how many new clients you're bringing on board, what's your marketing, what's your effect of, you know, uh, client onboarding with that marketing. How do you demonstrate the financial health of your business? Because if you could do that, right? the, the, the information you get back from, you, you have to open that door and then, and then you can expect that the seller will reciprocate with the information and the detail you're looking for to help buy the business. Um, but at the end of the day, it's up to buyers across the industry 
um, to really understand their own businesses, be able to demonstrate the health of their own businesses and have conversations with these sellers. And that opens up the gates and allows for these transactions to happen. You, you raise another couple of great points there. And, and the thing, you know, one is, you know, of course, you, first things first, you got to touch the heart before the brain. And if I know I've already got the finance going in, then if I'm looking, you know, to be, you know, I'm going to sell this thing, I can be at ease if you're bringing me a buyer who's already got the money. That's right. No, no problem there. I loved what you said too, knowing your business and you know, being able to demonstrate, here's, here's the retention of my clients. Here's how I bring them aboard, like you said, to make sure that, you know, the ease of doing business with me. You're telling that story. And how many times, you know, and that made me think about this, how different is this in buying a home? And if you want to compete and it's supply demand and there's not, you know, there's very little supply, but there's a lot of demand in these interest rates, you know, write the, write the seller a letter of why That's you right. really want right. this business, right? right? I mean, and it works, right? I mean, and, but it's true. We, we say this, it's, and I just was talking to a, a broker dealer about this the other day is that, you know, we're essentially teaching people to fish because sellers yeah. aren't going to always come to the table on their own, right? A, a lot of advisors, the founding generation, it's still a foreign concept to think that they could even sell their business. They didn't get into the industry that way, right? They didn't buy into the industry that way. No. And so and it's different, point. right? It's yeah. the first generation selling of independent yep. financial advisors. Most of us grew up. I grew up captive. The old IDS. Then it went That's to right. the, you know American Express, and then they opened things up. Place to start your career, not finish it. Uh, you know, and I know that's a terrible. I don't mean di any disrespect because I had a great ride there. But they opened up the candy store and showed us, oh, you can get twelve B one fees. You can get these trailers. Right. And, oh, we all started jumping ship, but not a good thing. You know, keeping. keeping but it was, you know, those guys. Uh, you know, like you said, you got to give Ameriprise credit uh, for training a great chunk of the industry. Oh, they're beautiful. But you know, since a lot of that's fallen off the wagon. Um, you know, we don't see that anymore. And so buyers and, you know, younger advisors have to get into the industry a different way. And, and this is kind of their, you know, some of these guys have already built a business. And so, so, so a lot of our buyers are my age, which I'm 43 now and, um, you know, give or take a few years, but some of these young guys, as we help them finance in, you know, they got their CFP, they went and worked in an internship, they kind of clawed their way up, you know, the corporate ladder. And I guess I have a soft spot for that because you know i i didn't come out of college um you know with this entrepreneurial mindset i i worked a job and then you know mm -hmm. you just kind of develop and um i guess i seized on opportunities so i i think that um you know there's a lot of people like that there are a lot of great business owners that might not be walk off the cliff you know entrepreneurs but can run a great business and right. and so we're helping I think, uh, you know, all people, but I, I think we're certainly helping that chunk of the population um, to get a foothold because they can offer great advice and they can be uh, great people for our industry. So I'm guessing that of all the different ways that a practice can transition, there's really no one that's per se better than the other in terms of its its structure, right? It's more of a how does this fit the people involved? How does this fit the buyer? How does this fit the seller? So that the, the soft side really becomes kind of the, the most important key of uh, like any client relationship. It's, it's a great analogy from the standpoint that not every client that walks through the door wants to work with a financial planner that does business the way I do. Right. And it's part of Phillips, you know, interview, you know, initial interview script, hey, let's figure out, can I help you? And then most importantly, do you want my help? And so that that side of things more so than the, the style of transition is is probably the most effect or most important, correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd say you, you've seen one financial uh, advisory practice, you've seen one financial advisory practice, right? right. Each one takes on the, the culture and the, you know, yeah personality of the founder. And then as they get bigger, they can take on a little bit more corporate structure and, and those are kind of fun to see, but they still have a lot of their founders, you know, personality and experience with them. And so, so you really are kind of, you know, it is interesting because you are merging, you know, two personalities together when you do these transactions. And, and that's where it goes back to, it sounds kind of um, like my shameless plug, but you know, you take the money factor out of it. Right. 
And it allows you to have the energy to focus on all the other issues around that client service transition because there's never a perfect alignment, right? No. You've you got 10 items on your bucket list. You're going to maybe get eight of them. Um, and then you create solutions around the other two items that might be sticking points. Sometimes it's investment philosophy. Sometimes there's tweaks to the, you know, uh, client service philosophy. Um, but, you know, in general, I think that uh, we see a lot of smart, creative people. There are a tremendous amount of tools and resources out in the industry now, you know, between consultants that help you with it, the technology uh, to better work with your clients. And, and so we enjoy seeing firms that continue to prove upon their own practice um, because they are very successful at uh, buying practices and, and buying other businesses because they can adapt, they can understand, they can make changes. Um, and, and they don't always walk into a conversation feeling like they've got the absolute prescription for what needs to happen. No silver bullet still. Yeah. You, like you said, you got to, you got to continuously help coach them and make sure you got a good fit here. You know, a question I have, and what's the biggest surprise you've had in the last few months? Uh, and as it relates, and I'm going to get some more specific to the pandemic, has that been is, is, in, in, yeah. in, if it, and is there you know, life before the pandemic, life during the pandemic, and life after? Any any big surprises or ahas that have come from this that you can share? Yeah, my my uh, Delta Sky Miles does not accumulate the same way it was <laughs> in 2019. You don't and, have that badge of honor, that dubious badge of honor, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I made what was my you know I made platinum status, and I'm sure I'm dropping. Um, yeah. No, I I think it we we have. Um, you know, one of the things that we worked on was building out an underwriting process that helped understand the systemic market risk that financial advisors have to their revenue. And we always kind of joked a little bit uh, that, that, you know, a market correction might be interesting for business. Um, and the pandemic, while I couldn't have ever even thought about it or dreamed about it, created two opportunities. One, it created that market correction which allowed a lot of our borrowers to prove that, you know, even though let's say the market was down, I don't know what it was, uh, 30%, you know, that, right. that a lot of our borrowers are only down maybe 16, 18% because of their portfolio construction, which is what we had demonstrated through our underwriting. And then we had demonstrated through our underwriting that, that these businesses could had enough free cash flow um, that they could take that type of market correction. And so that was fun to be able to see mm, that in person. That's powerful. That right there but, is very powerful. Yeah, but then the the second part of it was to just see how our industry adapted to this style of business. Um, Zoom meetings, right? I, I don't think, guys, I ever did a Zoom meeting. I probably did two or three Zoom meetings prior to February of 2020, right? Mm -hmm. Now I'm on six or eight of these things a day, right? I think I call my kids via Zoom. I'm not totally sure. But, um, you know, we eat dinner at the table. We just talk on Zoom. You know, it's so good. <laughs> well, at least we're talking. Uh, right, right, exactly. That's right? a good sign. That's right? progress. <laughs> we did, we did. My wife was on call Thanksgiving Day. And so so I was in charge of unthawing all the stuff uh, that we had pre-ordered, right? And, you know, here you are with uh, I have my four children around the table and and, you know, a bunch of relatives on zoom, right. As the computer is sitting there on the table, but um, no, I mean, it, what, what it proved is like we saw in, in March and April, you know, I had a client that had maybe 300 million under management. He picked up 140 million in assets by getting on the phone at the beginning of the pandemic and calling clients and talking to them and making sure they knew he was here and setting up zoom meetings for those that wanted it. And you're thinking, this is the test we needed, right? This is what we wanted to show that, that, well, the wealth management industry will continue to thrive. Uh, we never could have dreamed of pandemic, um, but it, it created a, a, a opportunity to us for us to demonstrate the viability and the portability of these businesses right. uh, and the survivability. Um, and then the third aspect of it that was kind of fun that I would have never expected is the rate drop. Um, you know, we were proving out a new vertical here. And so the interest rates were high. They were high sixes, low sevens. Mm -hmm. and, and because of what's happened here in the Fed funds rate, um, you know, rates have gone down into, you know, we're seeing our most common rates in the high fives. Um, and that's the level at which financial advisors say, hey, you know, I'm typically debt averse. But now this, 
price point makes sense. And so it's our job to now prove it and do as many loans as possible mm -hmm. uh, around these current rate environments and show that this is where they should be, if not even lower. And, and we'll continue to prove that this is a great vertical. And right. as our banks have said, you know, give us more of this because uh, this is doing well. It's my poor neighbor across the street owns four restaurants that, you know, oh. still are, you know, I mean, brutal, right? Yeah, just brutal. So, so we feel, we feel very fortunate uh, to be able to continue to thrive and, and grow mm -hmm. in this type of environment. And I, I couldn't have dreamed it. Well, the bottom line is that financial services is an incredibly adaptive yeah. industry. We've been adapting for years. We're slow. We're dinosaur. Right? I've always said it's really driven by the product producers. Right? When they want to change, change yeah. happens. And 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 now it has to and and we've really seen that we have the ability to continue to adapt so yeah. i i think that's that's really been a key message that we've had as well is don't sit back and wait for this to be quote unquote over move forward change your business and move forward and and so knowing that they've got partners out there that can help them out with that i think is a, is a great thing we're getting towards the end of our time. We were joking uh, and when we started out that uh, the three of us could talk for six or seven hours. And while we would enjoy that, I don't think our, our podcast <laughs> listens would be super high. It might high. go off the rails a little bit. Yeah, we'd go a little off topic. And Dan, Dan, before you go, and I know you're going to hit the air, and I think I know where you're going as we do with all, the, all, the, our, all our guests. But I... I got to throw in one other quote Aaron got his jab in and you, you guys might remember this one too that ties into Aaron remember this in times of crisis leadership is revealed in times of prosperity it's concealed so you know Aaron on the compliment to you and your team you've uh, stepped to the plate and you're showing where you know what true leadership's all about and how you can still make good things happen for a lot of people here well, I had good mentors. I remember that quote. So thanks for sharing that one again. But uh, it, it is, it's fun. It's fun to talk to you guys and catch up and spend too long. Um, so we've, we've enjoyed this. We've enjoyed this ride at, at uh, Skyview. We feel like we've really made an impact on the industry uh, that I'm not sure I would have even dreamed about three years ago. Um, so it's, it's been an absolute blast. And, you know, it is funny to think that you almost make more human connections in the middle of a pandemic working via Zoom you know, I mean, uh, you know, it's been what, uh, I've known you guys for 20 years and, you know, Fleeker, I saw, you know, we, we, uh, ate maybe a year ago or so. It was probably about that. Yeah. Right. And yeah, we get uh, together every couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. But Philip was always that, that rogue dude that lived way up North there. I don't know. <laughs> it's like North of Canada, whatever that is. So, you know, to be able to like sit here and chat, you know, is, is pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. it really is. So. Well, we will definitely have you back. So listeners, if you have specific questions on this topic, uh, send them into us, info at value-ability.com, and we'll give more uh, info on how to send in questions at the end of the podcast. But if you want to reach out to Aaron directly, he is Aaron.Hassler, H-A-S-L-E-R, at skyview.com and of course their website is skyview.com and that pre-approval questionnaire is right there on their homepage. We're going to send you off with this question. We ask all of our guests, what one pearl of wisdom that you've gotten from a either a mentor or a family that is particularly meaningful to you? Boy, that's a good question. And I said I was going to prepare for this and I didn't. Um, so <laughs> let's see. You know, I, it's it's hard. I'm never somebody that has these like absolute aha moments, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I always feel it's kind of that collective experience you have on all these mentors. But I, I've enjoyed, I think, always, uh, you know, what was really fun, uh, especially Fleek, as I got into the business, was working with all you guys who were a little bit older than I was, right? And so I had the benefit, and, and I don't know if it's still that way today, it maybe is, but of always being involved with or working with guys that were 5, 10, 15 years my, my senior. And so it was really, I think I learned more from the, the work habits and the communication and the personalities of each of these, mm -hmm. uh, as Good opposed point. to any one quote. Um, sure. 
you know, so I, I hate to say it. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a waffly answer. on <laughs> It's all um, good. It's all good. Well, it's, it's, it is very interesting on you know, the demographic side between you and me. So 47 to 43, they're really the lowest birth years for 30 or 40 years in every direction. So I even feel kind of the same that yeah. everybody seems to be a little bit older. Yeah. And, and, but I will I'll go back uh, to Aaron, how you started this off whether quote or not, but it's more observation, what you observed your father doing and yeah. on Saturdays and yeah. how he, you know, he really, he, he, he became, you know, uh, trustworthy by asking a lot of questions and developing them, you know, a relationship first and foremost, it doesn't get any better than that. And, and I, you reminded me another quote and i do like quotes you know because why say blah blah when you can say blah and 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 it's a ben franklin one and i don't know I, i'll screw it up i got dyslexia you know and and and, and, and so like you aaron uh, it takes me a while to get things but once i get them they last but it does not i'm not like the fleeker where boom bam boom goes the dynamite he's got it right, he's rolling right. right away right and it's you know you can either buy experience or you can borrow experience and like you said you've learned more from the you know people three years five years 15 i'm probably in that category no doubt i'm in that category 25 50 50 <laughs> and maybe 20, let's go even higher 20 so to be exact and and uh, someone's doing math but you know you can either buy uh, the experience or borrow the experience and borrowing the experience is you're you're learning from other people's you know you know, from the, the, the time they spent yeah. or, you know, their skills or the resources versus it's more painful if you got to buy it on your own. And then, you know, we always, Dan and I say, then if you keep having to buy it, you know, stupid is optional because how many times you have to keep repeating the same mistake over and over again. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, with that, I'm complete. I just think it's great seeing you. I'm proud of you. Well done. And uh, just thanks for the spending some time before we even kicked off, just bringing us up to speed on the family and, it's just cool, you know, get watching you guys grow up. Well, I'm I'm happy to send these kids up to uh, Camp Simonson uh, this summer. When does it start? What's the first session? <laughs> um, I'm ready, baby. <laughs> I love it's, kids. No, I, I I appreciate talking to you guys. Like I said, I feel like I benefited from a time in the industry, like we're talking about, where we had a lot of people to look up to. So it was fun to look up to both of you guys and, and to Nate, too, and, and the work hours you guys put in and the drive you guys had and the focus you had. So it's uh, it's super fun. It's set a great example and it's paid dividends for me. So thank you. Awesome. Well, we will wrap up our main section for this week. Again, if you want to touch base with Aaron, it's aaron.hassler at skyview.com or check out their website at skyview.com. Aaron, thanks so much. We will catch up again sometime soon. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate it. See you, Aaron. That wraps up our main section for this week. And as we went a little bit long in our conversation with Aaron Hassler, we are going to skip over our article review. We will double back and catch that one next week. Again, if you want to reach out to Aaron directly, Aaron.hassler, that's H-A-S-L-E-R at skyview.com or visit their website, skyview.com. If you have topics for us or questions, uh, we would love to have Aaron back on at a future time with your listener questions about practice succession planning. So send in your questions to us, email at info at value-ability.com. Again, that's info at value-ability.com. Or you can reach us through our social media links, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook links are all at value-ability.com under the contact us tab. Wherever you find us, please like, review, subscribe, and share. Next episode, episode 46, trading, investing, and planning. A lot of the things in the news lately, <laughs> especially around the uh, the GameStop fiasco slash uh, saga, 
have brought to my mind the differences between trading, investing, and planning. So we are going to dig into the differences there and how that all impacts what is going on in the markets and uh, the investing space today. What questions do you have for us about financial planning practice succession? Again, let us know what those questions are. We'd love to have Aaron back on in a future episode and get those questions answered for you. As always, thank you for listening. Be sure to join us next week. And remember that financial success comes from building a plan on the foundation of your values and building your ability will help you get there. This is a podcast collaboration, not a peer-reviewed journal or a sponsored publication. We make no representations as to accuracy, completeness, correctness, suitability, or validity of any information in this podcast and will not be liable for any errors, omissions, or delays in this information or any losses, injuries, or damages arising from its display or use. All information is provided on an as-is basis. It is the listener's responsibility to verify their own facts. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this podcast. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this podcast may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this podcast. Before acting on information on this podcast, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. Assumptions are not reflective of the position of any entity other than the authors, and since we are critically thinking human beings, these views are always subject to change, revision, and rethinking at any time. Please do not hold us to them in perpetuity.